Okay, great. The floor is yours. Awesome. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Ian Patterson. Uh, I'll throw a picture of myself up on the screen here. There's me. Um, my name's Ian. I'm one of the members here at Schooner Run Moriarty. Uh, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with us or it's been a while since we've talked with you, uh, we are a uh, boutique uh, federal contracts law firm. That's all that we do. Uh, so SBA, FAR compliance, all that type of stuff is, is our bread and butter. One of the unique things that I've had an opportunity to do working for the firm uh, is actually present uh, to Congress on the Defense Production Act. Uh, way back in the, the COVID times, uh, there was interest in trying to use the Defense Production Act as a way to spur production in the event that we needed, you know, a, a whole raft of medical equipment very quickly. And so I, I presented some information to Congress on it, and then it sort of went away. And uh, and now all of our friends at, at Apex are starting to get very interested in, in uh, DPA. And so here we are, and I get to present on again. So I'm very excited to, uh, to speak with you all today. Um, before I get rolling, a uh, quick plug. Uh, we all, those of us here at, at uh, Screen Over Moriarty, we write uh, for GovCon Brief, it's our blog. Uh, if you like the content here, if you like the delivery, uh, and you want to kind of keep up to date with with just sort of some interesting and quirky things happening in the federal contracting sphere, that's a really great resource. Uh, we always love uh, people coming over and taking a look. Um, and I, I'm sh I I hope and I think that some of you might already be uh, be registered and have looked at the blog before. So for those of you who have, thank you very much. So what are we talking about today? What's kind of the overview of, of what we're doing? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about where did the Defense Production Act come from to, to begin with? And understanding where this act come, come, or I came from really helps set the stage for what it does, how it does it, and why it's doing it. So we'll talk about a little bit of the history here. From there, we'll start looking at what the structure of the DPA is. The Defense Production Act is broken up into titles like many uh, congressional laws are. There are a couple titles that are of significant relevance here. Uh, and the first one is going to be Title I, and that's going to be authorities that the government has to be able to try and triage in the event of an emergency. These are things that are going to you know, give immediate authorities to direct contracting, prioritize ordering, and uh, prevent stockpiling, those types of things. Things that are really designed to be re reactionary in the event of an emergency. Then we'll talk about Title III authorities. And Title III authorities are, okay, we know that we may need to, to be able to react very quickly in the event of an emergency. How can we set ourselves up so that our industry partners have the resources and tools necessary to be able to respond very quickly in the event of an emergency. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the small business provisions out of Title VII. Uh, Title VII is a lot of administrative provisions. There are things that aren't particularly flashy. Um, it's a lot of eye glazing over if you read it. We're just gonna hit kind of the highlight reel of a couple of the important considerations for small business and then leave it there. Um, Title I and Title III are really where a lot of the interesting content is. So that's what uh, what our, our morning looks like here. It'll take us about 50, 55 minutes to get through it. Uh, and then there'll be some questions at the end. So off we go. So the Defense Production Act, where does it come from? How did we get here? As with a lot of things, it all starts with World War II. Uh, it, at the end of World War II, the United States was a industrial juggernaut. It was producing weapons and planes and boats and submarines and a whole host of other things in orders of magnitude that had never been seen by the world. And it was supplying them not just to itself, it was supplying them to its allies, including uh, the United Kingdom and at that point, actually, the Soviet Union. One of the ways that the United States had managed to do this and had really managed to leverage the, the might of its industrial power was to enact wartime laws that would rally manufacturing to produce all of these various combat tools and equipments, tanks, you know, and any number of other things, but also the infrastructure necessary to get them shipped. So 
trains to move them, ships to transport them across the ocean, you know, any host of things like that. So there, there was a whole kind of series of, of legal structures that was directing and compelling industry participants to support the United States in its war effort. The United States wins World War II, along with its allies, and then we enter the interwar period. This is, you know, 46, 47, 48. The wartime economic, economic laws are allowed to expire. The idea is, hey, we are in a, uh, you know, a, a peaceful environment. World War II was horrific. We are not going to see that level of devastation again. I think everybody learned their lesson. At least that was the idea. And so industry realizes, well, the, the money pool that used to be there for all of this defense production spending has dried up. So industry then pivots to civilian production. It goes, okay, well, I'm not going to be making a whole bunch of, you know, machine guns or, or you know, fighter aircraft. I'm going to turn over to civilian aircraft production and kind of let all of those skills and techniques that I learned in the R&D development on the defense side sort of wane. And there was this sort of overarching impression that that the nuclear capabilities of the United States and of sort of the world powers was really making conventional warfare. That is, you know, putting boots on the ground with, you know, tanks and guns and that thing obsolete. The, that the nuclear weapon is just going to completely revolutionize uh, how it was that wars were fought and was sort of the, the ultimate trump card. So all of this material wasn't really required. Well, the thing is, is that then the Korean War happens. And the Korean War happens in 1950, and it is a new conventional conflict. It is not a nuclear one. And what the United States found is it sort of found itself with its pants down because it didn't have the industrial capacity to rally immediately to start producing new tanks, new planes, new guns, new bullets. And it was immediately apparent that there was a need for new legal controls that could support and leverage the United States industrial might to be able to produce the goods and services that it needed in the event of a military or domestic emergency. To give you an idea of how fast this happened, here's essentially the timeline. We go from World War II industry juggernaut in 1945. We then pivot to you know, non-defense spending for industry. It's like, well, the United States government's no longer buying a whole bunch of military equipment. And then we have the Korean War in 1950. Those five years were enough to erode the, the skills and developmental resources of the United States industry. And so Congress went, we need to do something about this, which is where the Defense Production Act comes from. So what is it, right? The Defense Production Act is a combination of economic controls that may be used by the president or their designees to mobilize American industry for national defense. That's a lot. <laughs> and it's sort of written intentionally in a way that packs a lot of detail into as few words as possible, but it makes it very hard to digest. So let's look at a few of these features kind of isolated to break down what it is that's happening combination of economic controls. This is really what's at the heart of the Defense Production Act. The Defense Production Act is not one specific thing. What it is is a combination of tools that may be used to shape or compel certain behaviors, or in some cases prohibit, behaviors to allow American industry to support the country in, in times of great need. So it's not just one thing. And, and in practice, oftentimes it's not just utilizing one or two tools. It's utilizing a combination of three or four to achieve the outcomes that are needed. Because as with all things economic, there is there's a lot of competing and complicating factors that you have to control for. So the idea behind the DPA is let's provide tools and sort of strings that can be pulled so that we can we can be managing and manipulating all of these different variables from an economic standpoint to get what we need. This speaks to the what of the DPA. It's you know ordering preferences, it's material stockpiling, it's all of that type of stuff. It's those controls that can be used in combination to steer the economy. 
The next part is the president of the United States and their designees. This is speaking to the who of the DPA, who can implement and utilize the tools at their disposal to try and, and steer uh, industry and, and commercial players to support the United States. Here, it's really the president and then other high-ranking officials. Uh, as I mentioned, Title VII of the DPA goes into uh, a greater discussion of how do you delegate authority, who may be delegated authority, under what conditions, you know, blah, blah, blah. That stuff isn't something I'm going to cover in really any detail today. It's not particularly relevant for, for the sort of front-facing questions of the DPA, which is what are the powers and authorities that might touch businesses. But just know that, you know, the president gets named a lot in these, but there is the potential for delegation of some authorities as well. And then finally, to mobilize American industry for national defense. This is the why of the DPA. The whole idea of this is, is the Defense Production Act exists to rally industry in defense of the nation. So when you put all this together, what we're saying in this sort of condensed sentence is the Defense Production Act is a collection of economic controls that may be used by high-ranking government, or, uh, government officials to mobilize American industry for national defense. That's what it is. So from there, let's start kind of understanding what the DPA looks like. These are two of the definitions. I go into it because it's sort of important to understand what it is that is, is contained within the term national defense. And there's really two relevant definitions. The first one comes from the Defense Production Act itself, and it defines national defense as programs for military and energy production or construction, for critical infrastructure assistance to any foreign nation, um, you know, think Ukraine in these uh, in this definition, homeland security, stockpiling, space, and any directly related related activity. Essentially, what the Defense Production Act is saying is national defense relates to defense of the nation and its allies. That's the whole idea, um, but it casts a pretty broad net because that last little clause there and any directly related activity casts a bit of a shadow that allows some things that may not uh, you know, be stereotypically or prototypically part of, of national defense, as we would think of the term, be sort of pulled into uh, the ambit of what national defense is that could be covered by the Defense Production Act. And that's really why the definition is so important, because the Defense Production Act is designed to support national defense objectives. So you need to fit within the definition of national defense to be able to avail yourself of a lot of these defense production act requirements. The DPA has since been amended and that definition for national defense now also includes what's called emergency preparedness as defined by the Stadford Act. Uh, this one is, is it's a bit different because what it does is it expands defense production outside of just the military context and the defense context into uh, you know hazards to the civilian pop population to deal with immediate emergency conditions by the hazard and to effectuate emergency repairs. The Stadford Act is really more looking at things like natural disasters, and that's part of why during the pandemic, the, Net, or the Defense Production Act got brought up because the idea was that, well, the viral infection from COVID is a public hazard for the United States. And so that could be a, a national defense item under the DPA, which would then open up those tools for being able to try and, and build things like respirators or needles or, you know, um, N95 masks or any host of other things. Uh, but those are sort of the two critical definitions. So there's kind of two faces to the DPA because of how Congress has kind of tacked different definitions on. There is the true defense military side, and then there is also sort of this emergency preparedness side. Structurally, uh, the DPA was enacted in 1950, and when enacted, there were seven titles. And there was the priorities and allocations, there was authority to requisition and condemn. That was with uh, respect to property. 
There was Title III, which was expansion of productive capacity and supply. That was trying to build up resources and, and industries so that there would be available production capacity when it was needed. Title IV was price and wage stabilization, uh, and Title V sort of dovetailed with that. It was settlement of labor disputes. So Uncle Sam could get pretty heavy handed with that if he wanted to under DPA authorities. Uh, Title VI was control of consumer and real estate credit. And then Title VII was just general provisions. As I mentioned, these were speaking to uh, administrative considerations, things like who can be delegated authorities, you know, what, what type of uh, steering councils need to be set up, all that type of stuff. The thing is, is that when the DPA was enacted, they put a sunset on it. That's to say there was an expiration date for all of these various provisions. The idea being Congress recognized the need for some type of tool, but it wasn't sure that the tools that it had were going to be well suited for their task. And more importantly, a lot of these authorities really sort of fly in the face of free trade and free enterprise in the way that the United States conceptualizes that. So there was some pushback and risk of, you know, hey, this is really going to end up causing some problems and ruffling some feathers. So, so we need to put an end date on it so everyone is comfortable that, hey, this will come to an end if we need it to. What happened was in 1953, when that sunset happened, Congress allowed several of the titles to lapse. So they just they no longer exist in the, the current statutory record. They are not good law anymore. They're done. But what they did is they kept Title I, Title III, and Title VII, which is why if you're looking at the DPA today, if you're wondering why is it skipping a bunch, that's the reason why. It's because there used to be titles that would plug in between these things, but they no longer exist. So that's why we're looking at Title I and Title III. Uh, with that, and with sort of that tee up of, hey, here's the history, you know, how did we get here? It comes from World War II and Korea and sort of needing to build up the American industrial base again and sort of retool it. And then what is the actual structure of the law itself? Let's dig into some of the unique authorities and tools that are at the disposal of the president and their designees to try and marshal um, manufacturers and defense producers for national defense. So Title I, and, and as I kind of had mentioned, Title I is designed to be something that is kind of reactionary. The idea is there is an immediate emergency facing the United States. And so the United States government, the federal government in particular, needs to act rapidly to address that, that threat or challenge and to basically tell the country, you're going to do this for the good of the country, please smile about it. The first thing, and this is sort of the, the kind of highlight of Title I, Title I allows the president to, to put priorities in contracts and orders. Essentially what this does is it compels contractors to accept and perform a contract, and it also can compel those same contractors to prioritize performance of that contract. It does both. The way that I refer to this is that it's non-optional federal contracting. That's very unique, particularly for those of us who are used to the more traditional version of uh, federal contracting, where there's the RFP phase and you go through you know, proposal submissions and there's all the negotiation and all that type of stuff. The idea behind the priorities and contracts is we don't have time to mess around with that. So the president is just going to require contractors to accept and perform a contract if they have the capacity to do it, and they're going to require that contract to be prioritized. That's it. Um, and, and again, this is the whole idea behind this is that in an emergency, you don't have time to be messing around with red tape. So the DPA sort of rips it off. With respect to sort of implementing this authority, um, the president is also empowered to allocate various resources to protect national defense. This includes materials, services, facilities, and energy. All of this makes sense. If you have an emergency and you need to suddenly mobilize American industry, 
They're going to need materials in order to, to create goods. They're going to need facilities to do that. And it's probably going to take energy inputs, potentially in, in pretty substantial quantities, to get all of this stuff going. So the priorities and contracts and orders also gives the president the authority to be able to direct the allocation of this stuff in order to try and get things moving. Now, the materials, services, and facilities need to be deemed scarce, critical, and essential to either maintain or expand exploration, production, refining, or transportation, to conserve energy supplies. You know, it, it, maybe we're in a position where energy is actually the, the scarcest resource, uh, maybe if it's, if it's oil or, or what have you. And so conserving those energy supplies are important, so we may rely on them later or to construct or maintain energy facilities. Maybe the issue isn't inputs, maybe it's just we don't have facilities like power plants to turn those fossil fuels into actual usable electricity. Um, you know, this is, this is all something where it's designed to try and limit the use of these pretty significant authorities to those circumstances where there really is a critical need. None of this can be accomplished without exercising an allocation authority. So the president has to allocate the materials, the services, the facilities, and the energy, and then the materials need to be deemed you know, scarce for one of the reasons listed below. So there has to be determination. It's not like the president can just sort of run off the rails and go rogue and say, all right, here's what we're doing now because this is what I feel like it. There has to be a, a allocation and a, a determination that this is necessary, but that authority does exist under those circumstances. Second, uh, the, the Title I authorities, the next one is hoarding of designated scarce materials. Um, essentially what this does is it prohibits individuals or companies from either accumulating scarce materials in excess of reasonable demand or accumulating scarce materials for the purpose of resale at prices, prices in, in excess of the prevailing market prices. Um, the president is the one who gets to designate what materials are scarce, and that's what triggers this prohibition. Um, this, pro this provision actually, I think, speaks a lot to the early days of COVID. Um, the first one sort of speaks to toilet paper and that whole experience. If you all think back to, to early April of 2020, I don't know about you, but I had concerns about when the next time I was going to see a, a new a new pack of Cottonelle at Target was, um, largely because I hadn't really doomsday prep. And that first one goes to, you. It's it prohibits individuals, so in this case, you know, cheekily referring to all of the, the toilet paper hoarding, um, it prevents individuals or businesses from accumulating scarce materials, like toilet paper, in excess of reasonable demands of personal or home consumption. So the, the idea there is, you know, Nobody needs 38 packs of 36 rolls of pop of toilet paper. Just nobody did at that point in time, but people were doing it. So that's sort of what that first one goes to. The second one is the story of the people who were buying up a lot of N95 masks early on in the pandemic. Again, that, that same kind of April, May timeframe. And then we're reselling all of these N95 masks that they had bought without need and then reselling them at markups of 200, 300, and 400 percent. So the the hoarding of designated scarce materials provision is designed to stop those behaviors. And in a way, it, it sort of speaks to some of the foresight of Congress. Because remember that the DPA is a collection of tools. It's not just one. And so when you're trying to shape economic uh, activity, you need several tools to go after different considerations. One of these is trying to prevent hoarding and stockpiling in places where it's not actually benefiting the nation. So there's there's some when you start to think about it like that, you start to see that there is there's some there's some method to the madness here. The next sort of Title I provision is strengthening domestic uh, capability. What this does is it empowers the president to take appropriate action to ensure that certain things are available from reliable sources in response to national emergencies. These include critical components, critical technology items, essential materials, and industrial resources. 
basically anything that we would need to be able to be building whatever tools we need to overcome the challenge. That might be, again, respirators, it might be needles to put vaccines in arms, it might be, you know, M16s, it might be Radley fighting vehicles, you name it. This is These categories are broad enough that you can fit any of that comfortably into them. But the idea is, all right, here's what we're looking at. The appropriate action includes restricting contract competition to reliable or domestic sources. That would make sense. The idea is, all right, if we're in an emergency posture, we want to be contracting with folks who we know have a proven track record of being able to deliver on these contracts. Let's not mess around with trying to try somebody else out new. Let's go with what we know. Uh, Appropriate action also includes the government being able to stockpile critical components. So you can't do it as, as a consumer or a business, but if you're Uncle Sam, different rules apply. And then finally, uh, developing substitutes for critical items. The idea is, all right, if we know we're going to have choke points for certain things, um, you know, again, to sort of draw ties to our contemporary environment, uh, you know, things like uh, the semiconductor shortage for cars. If we know that that's going to be a choke point, the DPA allows the president to take appropriate action to try and develop a substitute. Maybe there's a different type of chip that we could make. Maybe there's a different manufacturing process. Maybe there's an alternative uh, formulation, any number of different things that would allow us to sort of break the log jam of that particular critical component so we can build more of it faster. The kind of spoiler to this is these authorities are sort of a preview to Article 3, which is where we're sort of, as I mentioned, Title Article 1 is referring to all of these tools that are designed to immediately happen in the event of an emergency. They, they allow immediate action, immediate compulsive contracting, all that type of stuff. Article 3 is building up capacity on the front end so that when you need to leverage that stuff, it's there. Some of this Title I authority here, the strengthening domestic capability, is really speaking to kind of Title III ideas. We just haven't gotten there yet. But I just want to kind of, if, if anyone, when we start going through Title III, starts to think this sounds familiar, that's why. You're right. It is sort of familiar. Uh, and then another one of these, these sort of kind of dovetaily uh, components between Title I and Title III is modernization of small business suppliers. Uh, According to the DPA, there is a, quote, strong preference for small business subcontractors and suppliers when using DPA authorities. Now, there's some really, really specific word choice that's being used here when Congress enacted the DPA. First, strong preference does not mean set aside. That's not the same thing. Strong preference means do it if you can. So that's thing number one. Don't read that to be set aside. Two, the strong preference is for small business subcontractors and suppliers when using DPA authorities. So this is not saying awarding prime contracts. This is saying, hey, small businesses should be involved and there's a strong preference for their involvement, but the level of their involvement is at a subcontract or supply level. At least that's the expectation announced by the DPA. Again, this may make some sense in the event of a national emergency. If you have a need for, you know, I, I keep going back to COVID, but it's the one that comes to my mind most immediately. If you have a need for, you know, 100,000 respirators and you've got a small business with a production capacity of maybe 100 to 200 a month, well, that small business doesn't have the resources to be able to fulfill the government's need. But someone with a, a larger and longer track record of doing mass manufacturing, someone like a Ford, a GM, uh, you know, maybe a, a Raytheon or, or General Dynamics, any number of these larger businesses that are in, you know, metal manufacturing, tooling, all that type of stuff. That's where you go. And then you bring in with a strong preference, these smaller businesses as subs, and suppliers to either help with refining the tooling, to supply the raw materials, what have you. But that's sort of what the DPA is envisioning. It, it is, it, it's saying, hey, there is a place for small businesses, but it might not be on the starting line. Now, the special consideration is also given to small businesses in areas of high unemployment or a demonstrated pattern of economic decline. Um, 
This isn't directly tied to hub zone, but in essence, it's getting after the same concept. Uh, the idea is, you know, there is essentially a, a strong preference for small businesses that are in pretty much hub zone areas because they're high unemployment and demonstrate pattern of economic decline. So there is some there, something there for small businesses, but when it comes to Title I, it isn't quite as strong as maybe some may like. Uh, now, an interesting thing here is that despite being a Title I authority, Title III funds are authorized to be used to guarantee purchases of manufacturing equipment to modernize small business suppliers. So in the event that really the holdup for a small business in supporting uh, people is that there isn't available, you know, equipment, tools, you know, what have you, there is an opportunity for the government under DPA authorities to guarantee purchases of manufacturing equipment so that everybody can, um, you know, get up to speed. The thing about it is that under Title III, you have to propose as a small business uh, what it is that you want and need and why. Basically, you have to come to the government with a proposal and say, hey, I need some some additional tooling here to be able to to fulfill your your needs or to meet whatever these production requirements are. And so can you help me with that? There should also be a strong preference for small businesses receiving that assistance, provided the following three things are in place. First, that small business has support of the agency and that the agency will provide the guarantee. So essentially it's like, okay, the, the agency is on board with this as well as the contractor. Second, the small business demonstrates that arrangements have been made to effectively utilize the advanced manufacturing equipment requested. So that's saying, okay, if we give you this equipment that you've requested, you can put it to use almost immediately. We're not just giving this to you and it's going to take you two years to figure out how to use it. We need the tools now and we need the production now. So if you're going to get this, you're going to start using it ASAP. That's the second requirement for the preference to trigger. And then finally, it has to otherwise meet the requirements of Title III, which we'll talk about. So essentially, there, there is a preference for small businesses to get help getting manufacturing equipment, but it has to be in a situation where there is support from an agency and that there are arrangements that have been made to effectively utilize that equipment immediately. So what are some examples of Title I projects? Um, you know, I've got a list here because it kind of helps to, to frame out what are we really looking at when we're talking about these resources? Well, the integrated ballistic, or, oh gosh, tripped over that one. Integrated ballistic missile defense system is an example of it. B-2 bomber, Air Force One, uh, the MRAP, the mine resistant ambush protected vehicles. Um, FEMA's response to electrical transmission system failures in Puerto Rico, and then uh, Department of Energy prioritization of natural gas to avoid uh, 2001 blackouts in California. These are just sort of a, a list of, of you know, what some Title I projects are. A lot of these are sort of, you know, big flashy items. And the reason why is because the idea of Title I is that it is responding to immediate national defense needs, um, you know. The, the MRAP vehicles were out there when there was a lot of uh, improvised explosive devices in Iraq and Afghanistan that were taking out American soldiers. So that was one of the items. FEMA's response to the electrical transmission system failures in Puerto Rico, uh, that's an example of where kind of that Stafford Act definition, the idea of, of emergency preparedness also being a national defense item. That's an example of that coming into play and being utilized. Uh, same with the prioritization of natural gas. And again, when you look at this list, what you can start to see is that there are different tools being used to respond to different concerns. So the prioritization authority was used with the natural gas uh, reserves. FEMA's response was uh, more geared towards getting infrastructure built. Um, I think that the B-2 bomber had more to do with prioritizations and, you know, you're going to work on this as your front project and then everything else is back burner, that type of thing. So, but these are just sort of a collection of, of what you would think of for Title I um, projects. That moves us to Title III. Title III is, is expansion of productive capacity and supply. And I know I've kind of talked about this a couple of times, but I think reiterating this helps kind of clarify what we're looking at. 
what we're doing now is we're moving out of Title I authorities. Title I authorities are the things that are in place to help in the event of an immediate crisis. So it's prioritizing, limiting hoarding, getting manufacturers the tools and resources that they need immediately. That's what Title I is doing. It's like a triage of things. Title III is acknowledging that, well, triaging doesn't do any good if we haven't prepped for it. And so Title III seeks to build up the industrial base of the United States so that things are in place when we need them. So we're going to pivot to talking about some of those provisions and how the government can support contractors to build up that capability. Uh, the first one is that there is a loan guarantee authority. The president may authorize agencies to guarantee loans by private institutions to support production capabilities, assuming that those capabilities support national defense. Uh, loan guarantees are available for contractors, for subcontractors, for providers of critical infrastructure, and then for other persons. Um, those four categories cover pretty much the whole scope of what I could imagine anybody trying to get DPA funds would be. So pretty much loan guarantees are open if there is a need for it to support national defense. The thing about it is that the loan guarantee authority can't be used primarily to avert bankruptcy. So the idea is Uncle Sam can't be your lender if you're facing bankruptcy. However, there's always an exception to that. And so if the bankruptcy would have direct or substantial adverse impact on defense production and a justification of the actions provided to various congressional committees, you can use DPA funds, even if it's probably to avert a bankruptcy. An example of where this might come to pass would be if our good friends over at Boeing, who are having a hell of a time right now, find themselves in a situation where they are looking at bankruptcy Given the fact that they have a whole host of federal contracts, they own McDonnell Douglas, who now who produced the F-18, and they're making more of them. That's a situation where losing Boeing could be a very big blow to the United States defense production capabilities. So that's an example that I could see where there may be a loan guarantee authority that might come from uh, DPA to avert a bankruptcy just because losing that production capability would be pretty devastating. But by and large, the idea is don't use DPA to avoid bankruptcies. Uh, in order to, to qualify for the guarantees, there has to be a presidential determination of a whole host of things. We're going to run through them pretty quick, but there's, I, I think, eight or nine different requirements. Um, first, the loan has to support production or supply that's essential for national defense. That makes sense. There has to be a direct correlation between the loan and the national defense issue to justify it being used under the DPA authorities. That just that sort of makes logical sense. Next, there has to be insufficient credit on the open market where the the guarantee is necessary to be able to do this. You know, and this might this might happen because either it's a, a new technology with high risk, and so no lenders are really interested in getting involved. Maybe it's a very expensive project, and so there isn't enough capital out there to really do it. Think something like the Manhattan Project. Um, you know, Maybe there's any number of other factors that are sort of working against free, free capital at that point in time. So there has to be sort of this determination of, hey, there isn't sufficient resource available to get this anywhere else. Uh, the loan guarantee needs to be the effective, expedient, and practical alternative to private loans. Um, you're going to find these uh, th this kind of trio of considerations several times as we're talking about Title III authorities, the idea of effective, expedient, and practical. I think that really what they're just doing is it's a shorthand for saying this has to be the best way to do this. If it's not the best way to do this, we're not doing it. We're not going to put American taxpayer monies into loan guarantees if it's not the best way to defend the nation. We're just not doing that. Uh, four, there has to be a reasonable expectation of repayment. So, you know, this is <laughs> essentially this is Uncle Sam's version of a credit check. He has to be satisfied that there's a, a good chance of being able to get this back. Five, uh, the interest on the loan needs to be deemed reasonable by the Secretary of the Treasury. This is sort of a, a, a gut check on, OK, are the terms good for Uncle Sam? Six, the loan agreement provisions cannot be waived without consent of a federal fiscal agent. Uh, the idea is you can't have 
non-authorized individuals within the government waiving material compliance terms, such as repayment requirements, things like that. Uh, and then finally, uh, the loan applicant has to provide assurance of repayment and a 20% bond collateral or insurance or something. Uh, you know, as with as with most loans, there has to be some type of skin in the game for whoever's the, the loan guarantee recipient in order to kind of incentivize them that, hey, you got to take this serious. So when you look at these requirements, it shouldn't be particularly surprising. Um, I mean, these are sort of the same types of requirements that any commercial lender would use. It's just it's being done on the federal level. And it's just really the government trying to say, hey, we just need to make sure this is a good use of taxpayer money. Uh, so is there a shortcut for the termination requirement? Yes. As with all good emergency requirements, yes, there is a shortcut. If Congress or the president declares a national emergency, you do not need to have the determination anymore. The idea being, hey, we're already in emergency postures now. We, we don't need to create more red tape. Again, let's just rip that all off. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the federal government may guarantee up to an aggregate of $50 million per shortfall before congressional committee notice is required. Um, again, that's sort of written in, in a dense way. What's going on is that the, the federal government designates shortfalls in terms of its, its industrial capacity. We'll talk about some of those a little bit later in the presentation and give you a sense of what that looks like. But what they're doing is they're sort of zeroing in on specific categories where the government believes that American manufacturers do not have significant production capacity of certain things. Um, you know, again, to kind of bring back recent events, uh, semiconductor production is an example of one that could come up, um, particularly certain types or speeds of processors. It's a good example of one that can come up. Uh, and so what will happen is that the government will uh, identify, you know, hey, you know, we've got a, a 60 megahertz, you know, uh, computer processor. That's a shortfall. So we're going to guarantee loans so that we can have American industries on U.S. soil build up manufacturing capability to produce that specific item. Um, essentially, what this is saying is that the federal government doesn't need to notify congressional committees unless there is 50 million or more dollars in aggregate allocated to businesses for that particular shortfall on a per shortfall basis. But again, as with all good rules, uh, the notice requirement can be waived during national emergencies as well. So the, the kind of take home here is that there are some checks and balances on using DPA authorities, unless, of course, there's a national emergency, in which case a lot of the things come off the rails. Uh, in addition to loan guarantees, there is also loans to private businesses. So, so there's sort of two ways that we can look at this. The loan guarantees are saying, all right, the, the business is going to go to a private lender, but then the United States is going to guarantee that loan so that the lender knows they're going to get repaid. That's option one. Option two is that Uncle Sam can just take the place of a banker. He can just say, all right, I'm going to be the one providing the loan. You're going to be responsible to repay me. I'm not guaranteeing anything. I'm just, I am your lender. Um, in much the same way, you know, Uncle Sam can choose to just make the loan direct uh, and they can do it to private businesses, to subcontractors, uh, contractors, providers of critical infrastructure or other persons. I mean, that, again, that's pretty much the world of potential federal contractors. So this is open to those groups as long as the loans are being given to build production capacity for national defense purposes. Um, Again, uh, a lot of this is going to look similar to the loan guarantee side of things. There is a lot of commonality between these two clauses, but we'll, we'll kind of talk about it briefly. Um, there has to be a determination that financial assistance is not otherwise available for private sources on a reasonable time. Again, this is taking us back to the same thing with the loan guarantee. The idea is the federal government is really the last way to get the, the critical financing done for some of these things. Uh, and then during emergency declarations, the president can determine that the loan supports production or support essential national defense, that without the loan, American industry cannot produce the items in a timely manner, that the loan is the most cost-effective, expedient, and practical strategy to meet the need. There's those three buzzwords again. That the anticipated earning power uh, and pledge security of the borrower, 
borrower are reasonable assurance of repayment and the loan interest rate is reasonable as determined by the Secretary of the Treasury. So again, a lot of this is sort of, you know, mirroring closely what the loan guarantee authority was in terms of what needs to be determined. Uh, the idea, though, is that the government would use one of the two. Uh, either you would be using the loan authority or you'd be using the loan guarantee authority. It's you just kind of pick which one to use. Uh, kind of the last big thing here is sort of the catch-all provision. These are other presidential action authorized. What this does is it broadly authorizes the president to take a, a whole host of actions to support national defense. These include uh, either making purchases or purchase commitments for resources for government use or resale, um, encouraging exploration uh, and mining of critical strategic materials, developing production capabilities and capacities, and increasing use and implementation of emerging technologies. Again, this is sort of just a big catch-all provision of saying, hey, let's, let's do proactive things to put American manufacturers in a better place to support us in the event of an actual emergency. Uh, we'll talk about you know, several of these provisions and kind of what the authorities are. The first one we're gonna talk about is the purchases and purchase commitment. So the president may purchase or commit to purchasing resources or technology that supports national defense. Uh, the idea here is that you know, the commitment might be what's necessary for private industry to feel comfortable about moving forward, particularly with things that maybe are higher risk um, technologies that have higher chances for failure, things like that. In order to do this, the president has to determine that the supply, uh, resource, or technology is essential to national defense. That makes sense. We're talking DPA. So if you're going to be buying something, it needs to be related to defense or emergency preparedness. Uh, that absent action, American industry cannot meet supply demands promptly. This is sort of that urgency question. It's saying, okay, are we in a position where if we don't do this, we're not going to have that, that capability if we need it? Uh, and then purchase or purchase commitments are the most cost-effective, expedient, and practical solution. Um, again, that's sort of just asking, is this the best way to do this? Any commodities that are bought this way uh, have to be resold at the lower of either an established ceiling price or whatever the prevailing market rate is. Uh, the idea is that uh, the government can't get into the business of buying up a whole bunch of stuff and either flipping it for a profit uh, or trying to saturate the market with undervalued goods. Uh, it's just, you know, the, basically the idea is that Uncle Sam is entering the market as a market participant. He's paying market rates and that's the deal. But um, the, the take home here is that Uncle Sam can commit to purchase or commit to purchasing certain things if that's what industry needs to keep certain um production lines open or, you know, capabilities fresh and ready to go. Uh, subsidies. Uh, in addition to that, the president may subsidize domestically produced materials to ensure a continued supply of resources or maintain stable pricing. Um, these are, uh, the, the use of subsidies are, are authorized in a few different situations. Um, first is that if at, at fair market prices for a raw material, there will be a decrease in supply from high cost resources um, that adversely impacts DPA objectives. The idea here is that, hey, some resources are actually really expensive to mine. And so if we don't subsidize that at least somewhat, we might lose out on production capabilities for you know high, high cost extractions. We don't want to do that. So instead, we will subsidize so that if we do need those resources in an emergency posture, they're there for us. The other circumstance is if the cost of transportation has a temporary increase that threatens to impair production or supply of material at stable price. Um, this is more so getting at the idea of, OK, we have the resource, but we're struggling to get it to the manufacturing centers, uh, you know, Pittsburgh for steel or, you know, what, what have you. Um, a good example of where this might come into play was a few years back when the uh, interstate bridge over, I think it was the Mississippi and Tennessee, uh, ended up, they found a whole bunch of, of structural problems with it, and it was it was breaking under the strain, and they had to close it for a month or two to get repairs done. Um, There's a lot of freight and trucking that had to get rerouted that added a lot of miles and added costs. And so that's sort of an example of where there might be a transportation cost with a temporary increase that threatens to impair 
production and uh, of a material at a stable price that the government might get involved if it was if it rose to a national defense concern. I don't believe that that one ever did, um, but it's those types of circumstances uh, that you could foresee being something where, hey, government might jump in and, and get a subsidy going. Um, installation of federal property at private facilities. Uh, the idea here is, hey, if maybe Uncle Sam has bought under one of it, their other authorities a whole bunch of, of milling machines or other tooling, um, but it's just sort of sitting on the reserve, well, the place where you're going to need that to be is with manufacturers to actually utilize it. So there is the authority to install federal property at private facilities. Um, again, you need to determine that, that this would aid national defense, and then it has to improve uh, federal industrial facility. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know, there, there has to be sort of this, this you know, national defense component. It has to aid manufacturing. But there's several different ways that installation of federal property can happen. Um, it can happen either through the improvement of federal uh, industrial facilities through equipment purchases or expansions. Uh, the government can go out and can procure and install federally owned equipment in private facilities. That's sort of the example I was talking about earlier with the, hey, if you own milling equipment or, or anything like that. Um, it can also use DPA authorities to provide for the expansion or modification of private facilities. Or it can just transfer or sell property to private owners of production facilities. You know, if if Uncle Sam owns something but is never going to practically use it to produce anything, what good is it? So they can just transfer or sell it to a private owner who is going to use it and then use it for DPA requirements, um, potentially using Title I authorities to do that. So this is just another sort of tool in the arsenal of, of the president and then his designees to be able to try and get not just resources, but the necessary manufacturing tools to manufacturers in an effective time period to meet emergencies for the United States. Um, Defense Production Act Fund. This one is less of an authority and just more of something that is out there. Um, the Defense Production Act Fund is a fund that exists to fund Title III initiatives. The idea is, all right, if we're going to be saying that, you know, we want to support industries here and have them investing resources and things like that, um, we need to provide the money to do it. The ceiling value on the fund is $750 million. I got a fun little table here that's, that is sort of inputs into the fund uh, through 2020. So as you can see, there's been some pretty big investments here from Congress. You know, there's $170 million that went in, in 2012, another 200 and almost two and a quarter um, in 2013, and then a smattering of, you know, between 30 and $75 million as well. So there's there's a lot of money in that fund. Um, some examples of Title III projects. Um, one of them was advanced drop-in biofuel production. Uh, that's developing biofuels for military and commercial use that can be used without needing to modify the engines or any of the intake stuff. It's just, bam, you can dump it in, it's good to go. Um, that that reduces uh, reliance on oil resources. Uh, K-band gallium nitrate monolithic microwave integrated circuits. Uh, that's speaking to sort of the the kind of processor type things. Um, you know, trying to to develop a domestic supply to produce those types of circuits. Um, again, most of the Title Three things that are out there right now are really going to be projects that are getting funding. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, loan guarantees, or well, loans and loan guarantee authorities have not been used for more than 30 years. And I, I've, I've had people ask me, oh, you think that's coming back? And my answer is, I really don't think so. Um, the There's capital out there right now. There, there are the government has identified some domestic shortfalls, but they're not the type that are so extravagant that you'd need Uncle Sam to get involved as a financier. I just don't know that that's really available. Uh, so, you know, I, I know that that's sometimes enticing, particularly for small businesses that are are kind of capital hungry. But unfortunately, I, I just I haven't seen those authorities be used in my lifetime. Um, all right. Title seven. We're going to talk just very briefly about this. Title seven doubles back on the small business concerns. And it kind of comes back and says, well, small businesses 
should be given the maximum practical opportunity to, to participate as contractors and subcontractors at various tiers in all programs to strengthen the national or the nation's industrial base and technology base pursuant to this act. Um, the, the thing that was interesting about this is that this is the first time that the DPA says, oh yeah, they should be both prime and subs. In Title I, it doesn't say that. And I think that that's an intentional omission to be perfect. I think the idea is, hey, small businesses, we want you there. We want you to develop capabilities. But hey, if we're in an emergency posture, we're going with what we know. But when it comes to resource allocation, so you know, if you're in a, a scarcity situation for materials that are necess necessary for production, the DPA does provide some protection for small businesses, and it says that they should receive a proportionate amount commensurate with what they would usually receive of that material or resource during normal conditions. The idea is let's not penalize small businesses if there's an emergency. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about just very briefly is leveraging Title III. Um, I know this is sort of, again, one of the things that's kind of the highlight right now. So the Defense Production Act Title III office, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's the office designated for administering uh, DPA, shouldn't be PDA, I should fix that, uh, Title III opportunities to identify and mitigate uh, critical industrial-based shortcomings. There's two interfaces between DPA Title III and industry. The first is a request for information. Essentially what this does is it's seeking in information from industry regarding capabilities in specific areas. And then what that information does is it helps develop guidelines within the office for future funding allocations. The idea is let's get information about what industry can do and we'll work from there. The other is a funding opportunity announcement. This is providing DPA funding to address production area shortfalls. It's that second one that is likely more interesting to many PTAC clients. Uh, that's where the money is when it comes to Title III. The request for information could be useful if there's maybe a tool or resource that the government isn't buying in significant quantities, but the funding opportunity is really where the, where the rubber meets the road. Here is a list of the active authorization values for certain items. Uh, and I pulled this kind of at the end of 2023. What you'll see is that a lot of these are very specific. I mean, you've got things like advanced manufacturing techniques for DOD music, mun uh, munitions, uh, sonar buoy production, uh, air breathing engines, advanced avionics for hypersonic systems, you know, these are specific areas that have specific requirements and the Title III office website will list what the active funding opportunities are. But again, the authorizations here, there are some with no limit, but a lot of them are hanging out in that 50 to $100 million worth of total aggregate spending power location. So that's sort of where the money is for, um, for clients who are interested. Um, but that's, that's kind of what we're looking at. Again, what I found with DPA is that if you have a skill or resource that dovetails nicely with what the government wants for defense, you can totally have it made in the shade with DPA. But for those clients that don't fit clearly within what the government wants to be buying for defense, DPA just doesn't offer an awful lot of reason or an awful lot of, awful lot of opportunity. There's, there aren't quite the opportunities there. So... Um, that's just my take, though. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are some other people who have stories of, of wild success with DPA involvement, but that's just kind of what I have seen. With that, um, I mean, we're almost right at 10 o'clock on the nose. Um, so I think that there might be a couple things in the chat here. Um, and then, you know, here's my contact information if you want to follow up. Let's see. Thank you, Ian. That was yeah. very thorough. <laughs> We Perfect. appreciate it. So no, there are no questions, actually. I think people are just glad to get this information for the first time, probably taking notes. A couple of the questions are for me asking about the presentation. I'm going to be sending over those slides and the recording will be available later today. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to thank you, Ian, for, for doing all this work of putting this presentation together for us. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And obviously, if you want to follow up with Ian or any, any of his team, you've got all his contact information there. So thank you again, everybody. And we hope to see you at a future Apex webinar event. Bye-bye.
Awesome. Thanks all.